Africa, the idea was colonial space within Europe, which meant German expansionism. And that policy guided him. The idea was he wanted the Volga as the Mississippi of Germany, and he wanted to expand most particularly to the Ukraine, which was uh, the breadbasket of Europe. The second was a racial policy, and the racial policy was to breed the master race and also to uh, get Jews off the space of German lands, German society, German culture, German life. And there's considerable evidence to say that the first stage of that was to get Jews to leave. And then as if you look at German policy, if you make it impossible for Jews to live as Jews in Germany, they will leave. And that ultimately moved from an, what uh, Goldhagen calls an eliminationist anti-Semitism to exterminationist anti-Semitism, but we don't see that in a simple line. There's a problem with that, with the two policies, which is that they conflicted. If you keep expanding German space, and in with each space you enter, you get more and more Jews, the question then becomes, what do you do with the Jews? And we're gonna see that policy evolve. So you all know that Germany expanded in 1938 into Austria. It expanded in 1938 into the Sudetenland. In 1939, it expanded into Czechoslovakia and dismembered Czechoslovakia into the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and then also into the independent but allied state of Slovakia. And since I wrote of Slovakia yesterday, let me also just indicate the one line which is that Slovakia was a country that was head, headed by a Roman Catholic priest whose behavior toward the Jews and toward his own population was anything but priestly. And that's Joseph Tiso, who was never excommunicated by the Vatican then or since. September 1, 1939, Germany expands into Poland. Now you have to understand that Germany expanded into Poland. Germany conquered Poland from the West and the Soviet Union entered Poland on September 17th from the East. Dividing Poland in part, two million Jews come under German control, about one and a half million Jews come under Soviet control. That becomes an absolutely pivotal moment in German life, Jewish life, and in Soviet life. And let me just say that Jews living in the lands close to the Soviet occupied territory, or even living on the areas of the Soviet occupied territory had a fundamental crisis and a problem to deal with. The problem is, if you judge from history, in World War I, Germany was a benign occupier and the Russians were a disastrous occupier, raping, plundering, and doing all sorts of lovely things. So if you judge by history, and if you also judge that for 100 years, the movement westward was a movement toward greater freedom, you would move into German territories, but if you understood that Nazism was a unique menacing evil, you moved into Soviet territories. And Jews living in the areas nearby had to make an existential decision and a life and death decision. The next decision that those who moved to Soviet territories had to make, most especially Polish Jews, was a decision in 1940 whether to accept German, uh, whether to accept Soviet citizenship or to remain citizens of Poland, which was a non-existent state at that point. The irony of ironies is that those who accepted, who did not accept uh, Soviet citizenship, were deported to um, Siberia. They, for the most part, to Siberia, they faced a whole range of 
cold, famine, disease, malnutrition, slave labor, but they didn't face mass murder and they survived. And we're going to see that those who remained in Soviet territories that were later conquered by the Germans ended up uh, being essentially the first of the Jews to be slaughtered in massive numbers. We're going to come to that. So Poland is divided. And the best way of saying what the story in Western Poland was in German-occupied Poland is that you have to understand three words, ghettoization, deportation, concentration. You can understand the fourth word, which is death, namely, between 1940 and 42, Polish Jewry was ghettoized. The Jews in German occupied or German annexed territories were uh, ghettoized. And deportation occurred sometimes as they moved Jews from small, small towns, hamlets, and villages to larger towns and communities. They were then in a ghetto. Some ghettos were open, some were closed. We'll talk about that in a moment. In 1942, beginning in late 1941, the infrastructure for the destruction of Jews was put in place. That ultimately included the death camps. And we'll see that there was an evolution in the killing. And the evolution essentially in the killing was that in the far eastern areas of German domination, Jews were killed by mobile killing units, which we'll see in a moment. In Poland, in occupied Poland, the Jews were too numerous to do it that way. So the metaphor was reversed. Instead of making the killers mobile and the victims stationary, the victims were made mobile. The instrumentality of their mobility was the railroad car. And the mobile Jews were sent to stationary killing centers built on Henry Ford's notion of an assembly line. The assembly line was a factory of death. The end product was the destruction and annihilation of the Jews, and also the taking of all of their property, both uh, their external property and even the property they had brought with them as part of their body and essentially destroying them. But they didn't know it then. So ghettoization should be regarded from two perspectives. From the German perspective, Ghettoization was a place to contain Jews until, until what they didn't know when ghettoization began, to contain and to separate and segregate Jews. And for the Jews, ghettoization was a place to live until, not knowing until what, presuming that it was until Germany came to its census, until the war, the Allies came to their rescue. You, uh, inevitably they would live in a life of discrimination and persecution, but they had to make a life of it. Until became clear in 1942, and that meant until the infrastructure was, was created for the annihilation of the Jews, I'm not going to use extermination because it's a Nazi term, and then once that was created, it became a swift process of destruction. You want to know how swift? Let me give you one basic statistic. On January 20th, 1942, there was the Von Zay Conference. 15 of the number two men, all men, so women do not take umbrage, in the major bureaucracies, army, and party institutions were gathered. Eight of them had doctorates. They were not gathered to make a decision. They were gathered to be informed that the SS would be in charge and that every agency was expected to subordinate its needs to the SS's needs. And at that day, eight of 10 of the Jews who were to be killed in the Holocaust were still alive. 16 months later, 
between 75 and 80 percent of the Jews who were to be killed in the Holocaust were already dead. So once the infrastructure was built, deportations began, annihilation took place, and that's what I mean. The three words in Western Poland are ghettoization, deportation, sometimes deportation to ghettos, then deportation to death camps, and annihilation at that point. That's the story of Poland. We can go into the inner life of the ghetto if we have time, but suffice it to say that they are doomed communities not knowing they're doomed, and that Jews tried to make a life in this in-between stage and you had uh, a combination of multiple ways in which Jews made a life, despite the certainty that uh, yesterday was better than today, and today will be better than tomorrow. Only in 1942, when deportation became clear, did the ghettos begin to perceive how doomed and how disastrous their situation was to be. Let's talk for a moment about Western Europe. Germany invaded Western Europe in the spring of 1940. Luxembourg, uh, uh, Belgium, France, Netherlands, Denmark, and they conquered the countries in Western Europe. And the best way of saying it, if you wanna have a quick overview, if we say in Western Europe, in Eastern, in Poland, it's ghettoization, deportation, death. The best way of saying it in, um, in um, Western Europe is that essentially it is a process of disemancipation, the loss of all civil rights, civil liberties, and the like, expropriation of Jewish property and Jewish businesses, persecution, and then an institution was established called a transit camp. And the transit camp was essentially established, let's use France as an example. Jews were gathered, they were sent to a transit camp and from that transit camp in France, and we can generalize whether it's occupied France or quasi independent uh, 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 German allied France, Vichy France, Jews were sent to a transit camp, and from the transit camp, they were sent essentially to death camps. In the Netherlands, the transit camps were uh, uh, West Vesterbrook and Voigt. In France, there were numerous ones. In uh, Belgium, it was Malines. The one exception to the story of disemancipation is Denmark. And Denmark essentially said, we don't have a Jewish problem, we only have Danish citizens. And by the time they came for the Danish citizens in 1943, this was after the Battle of Stalingrad when people understood that Germany is in all likelihood gonna lose the war. That's when Denmark, Danish resistance came into play but even then, Jews didn't have to wear a yellow star in Denmark, so all the legends about the king wearing a yellow star are false, because no yellow star was imposed. Dan Dan Danish's, Denmark's great achievement was it treated the Jews as citizens and as fellow citizens, and in fact, even after the Jews left for, where some Jews were deported to Tresenstadt, but even after the Jews left and were sent to uh, Sweden, Denmark protected Jewish property, protected Jewish homes, protected Jewish businesses, where all the other Western European countries confiscated Jewish homes, Jewish properties, and Jewish businesses, and were involved in either the direct or indirect beneficiaries of expropriation. Now let's go for, so we see a process. The process took different, different um, shapes in different countries. In Denmark, the Jews were rescued. In um, Holland, which has a generally good reputation, undeservedly so, 
105,000 of 140,000 Jews were killed. And that was after a national strike in solidarity with the Jews. But in Holland, essentially, the Dutch police were involved in rounding up and deport, deporting Jews. And when they deported Jews, they were sent to Vesterbrook. And every Tuesday, Jews were sent from Vesterbrook primarily to Auschwitz and secondarily to Sobibor. So you have that type of phenomenon. In France, 75,000 of the French Jews more or less were killed. Many of them were not French citizens, but were people who had found their way to France. And the interesting thing is that you did not have, and they were um, uh, living in France, but not French citizens. And the French felt more comfortable with their deportation, though there's an extraordinary exchange in which in some transit camps they deported the adults but not the children and then the French pleaded you couldn't separate families to deport the, uh, put the children together with their parents on train on trains with some deeply knowing that the end result of trains is destruction and murder but again we don't want to be involved in family separation it's an inhumane policy and uh, and the like, which uh, may mean either denial of the ultimate reality, which some of them must have sensed, or in a very different way, it may have uh, meant that they really didn't want to have to put up with Jewish children who would need absorption and adoption and joining the family. In Belgium, you had an interesting phenomenon, which is about 25,000 of the 66,000 Jews of Belgium were saved by underground uh, rescue efforts. And the rest were deported from Belgium via Malines. And uh, consequently, you have again the phenomenon of transit camp. The phenomenon was radically different in Eastern Europe, where if what you have in, in Poland was ghettoization, deportation, death camps, you have beginning on June 22nd, 1941, you essentially have invasion, mass murder, then ghettoization of the survivors, mass murder too, and then the remaining Jews who were ghettoized were sent to, um, to um, death camps. I'm gonna play a brief film clip. I'm gonna play two of them. Um, and we'll play the first, which uh, appears in the Durban uh, permanent exhibition. But this tells you essentially what the uh, mobile killing units did. But I want you also to understand that the mobile killing units did not operate alone. The mobile killing units were supported by the German army. They also were supported by the Romanian and the Hungarian army. And one of the most grotesque documents you can read in the Holocaust is a complaint by the German army of why the Romanian army is so inhumane, even if they're going to kill these Jews. Why do they torture them before they kill them? Uh, it's sufficient to kill them. They were supported by local gendarmerie, by native anti-Semites. And in some countries, the killing was not done by Germans, but was done by the local population. In Estonia, no Jew was killed by Germans. They were killed by Estonians. In Lithuania, two out of three Jews were killed by Lithuanians who were promised uh, essentially independence and the way in which they cleansed themselves from their collaboration with the Soviet Union, which had occupied Lithuania from 1939 through 1941, was to cooperate with the Germans. It's what Tim Snyder calls double collaboration and the way you cost yourself, the way you cleanse yourself of your collaboration 
is to do the dirty work for the uh, Germans by killing their own Jews. So two out of three Jews in Lithuania were killed by Lithuanians. And we just saw in recent research how vast the number of killing fields are in the Ukraine and in Lithuania. And then you know the work of uh, Jan Gross with the work of neighbors in which what you have is this incredible description in Yervavne of the fact that the Germans in the vicinity gave the Poles in the town the excuse to kill the local Jewish population, which they killed, but it's Jews that they knew by name, whom they had done business with, whom they had bought stuff from, sold stuff to, and they killed children who went to school with their own children, children whom they knew by name, and children who may have even played in their home with their own children. And this was the role of neighbors. It fulfills the biblical statement, are you going to massacre and then murder? So let's look because this is a, a, a wonderful and short uh, video. And we'll see uh, one and then I'll explain the second one to you. This is a wonderful and short video that explains to you all of the players involved in this mass murder. These people kill every day several times a week in tar communities no end on to the next one and they're relentless about it let's go to the next place more no satisfaction no end They had identified the Jews in advance, pulled them all into the town center. And again, they were careful not to let anyone really know what the end result was going to be as much as they could until it was too late. This film, which lasts less than two minutes, I think, was taken by an off-duty German military officer who attended this mass shooting uh, on the coast in Latvia in the latter part of June of 1941, or the very early part of July. The film is a remarkable document, if you will. Within its very brief time period, um, gives us access to all of the actors in this horrific drama. You have the victims, and you see that in this case, these are all men, some of whom have been beaten uh, before being conveyed to the execution site. The shooters, these are uniformed SS and police personnel who are actually carrying out the shootings. Then you have another important actor in the drama, and that is the local auxiliaries who assisted the German SS and police in the shootings. These are the men with white armbands carrying probably their hunting rifles or their weapons that they used for their own purposes. And then of course you have the so-called bystanders, the witnesses, including children in short pants who are witnessing this really grotesque spectacle. And they're not witnessing anonymous people being shot. Um, they're witnessing their neighbors, their teachers, their pharmacists, their physicians. Uh, people who, with whom they've grown up, whom they looked up to perhaps. Um, there's a kind of intimacy to the murders that is both incredibly unsettling, but also a kind of grotesque nature to it. For me, the most chilling thing is that for the shooters, there's a kind of quotidian boredom to what they're doing in some cases. You see 
the guy smoking, blowing out the smoke, um, evidence that this is a, um, a kind of routine, uh, in some cases, boring task that they're following through on. The most chilling set of frames in that for me is this pet dog that someone brings with them. How the dog is startled by the, by the rifle shots and darts across the frame. A kind of reflexive reaction on the part of the animal to the shots. Who brought the dog there? Um, did the dog go back home with them? What was the dog doing on, on this scene when people were being, being murdered? There's another scene of one of the SS and police officers kind of skipping down the hillside and he kind of jumps and skittles down the slope. I don't know why that moves me, but it, but it does. And I think nothing tells you uh, as clearly what these killing fields were like. Um, we're going to have in one moment, but I want to say to you that in recent years, you've had an effort by Father Patrick Dubois of France to go back to these various towns, villages, and hamlets throughout the um, uh, occup then occupied Soviet Union and to ask people in their 80s, and remember if it's 75 years from the liberation, it's 79 years from these killings, to ask people to identify the sites of mass graves. He's identified the sites of mass graves, which are far more numerous than we ever imagined. He's dug up the mass graves and found some very interesting things. He's found the bullets. Bullets are forensic evidence, so if you have the bullets, you understand precisely who did the killing. And with the doing of the killing, you understand if it was local, it was, if it was the Wehrmacht, it was, if it was the SS, if it was the Einsatzgruppe, and if it was the uh, other armies, if it was the local guy with the bullets that he bought uh, from his rifle. So you understand that forensic evidence. You also understand something else, which is some people have no marks on, their, on them, which means some people were thrown in alive into the graves. And we're going to hear from one such person. This is the only testimony I know of someone who was buried alive, which will tell you the story. This is a very special person for a very different reason, which is he comes from the town of Ashishki, Ashishuk. And those of you who've been to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum know the Tower of Victims in Ashishuk. Those are the population. And he's describing the murder of that entire population on the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, beginning the day after Rosh Hashanah. So really, literally, the yard site is going to be a couple of a couple of weeks away. Four four weeks away is their yard site, and he was a ten year old child who was buried alive. Now I'm going to warn you on this. There's uh, nothing graphic to see, but you're going to hear a couple of things that are going to make you at the same time laugh and cry. But it's all right to laugh and cry as you listen to this testimony, please.
they used to take four lines, 20 people, and keep the rest behind to let the 20 people undressed. Chasing with the dogs over the beatings of sticks close to the graves. Don't care if it's children or men or humans. Blah 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 blah. blah, blah, blah. Killed this twenty. The rest while meanwhile. Yeah, came into the graves. Meanwhile, the second line. Undressed, was chased, and so on, so on. My brother, when he kept him, my brother didn't let off my father for a second. Whatever he did, he did. When he grabbed him by the right leg, he wouldn't let him go. When he slapped him, him, I never saw his face. He was so in hiding his face to his life. We are marching, and the fighter tells me the same thing. Before we came to the edge, Reb Zushi, my teacher, Talmud teacher, say only saying, saying a prayer, saying prayer. <laughs> I remember the prayer. He says, "I pull me to throw elef, uvava me menecha, elecha lo yigash." I accept this word as I, I, I feel better, I, I feel good, makes me feel good, these words. Even I have no hope. And the machine can start to play and the machine can start to shoot. His arm on my neck. When shooting starts, machine guns get off. When I feel like it, he gave me a push in into the grave. When it up me in, I fall in, he fall in on me. I hear, I hear him howling. His blood was all on me. Probably he got in chest shot. I was he was laying on me. And I don't know how many times, five minutes, ten minutes, but I'm still unconscious. I know what's going on. I feel I'm not dead. I to myself, if that is dead, it's not so bad. I, I'm still alive, <laughs> but for <laughs> longer time, I feel his body on me, and get heavier and heavier and heavier. I'm joking, I can't take him anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 my tattle, my tattle. <laughs> but I couldn't take it anymore, it's weight. I tried to slide out. When I slide out in way other cops, other dead people, they wouldn't let me. I was out to slide out from him. But I managed somehow. I managed somehow. But they feel my nobody for a lot. Yes. Trying. But I feel I'm not dead, I'm not alive. But I came, I got more strength. 
ever meant you can't just stop but come back to me and not to give anybody a sign to somebody in survive because I hear every time screaming or yelling or crying to used to come when I hear single shots to used to finish that I don't know I hear a lot of comments around me yelling and I'm talking. <sighs> but they all went away probably. I didn't look around myself. I couldn't look from the grave up. I could see only the skies. Couldn't see what's around me. Little by little, <sighs> pull over to the edge. I lift up myself. And I start to run, run, not looking back what happened, the lightning led, they shoot me while I'm running. I start to go naked, naked, except the cover, the only cover I got is the blood, the blood of my father, of my brother, of Reb Sushi, they were surrounding me all. I couldn't sit down. I took cares. I'm free. That gives you a tremendous sense of what a 10 year old kid must have experienced as he went in. And you'll understand the verse that his teacher quoted him is a verse from Psalms on your right hand, on your right hand, a thousand will fall. On your left hand, 20,000 will fall, but you they will not touch. And the other thing is that his father clearly protected him. And part of what we've discovered in the excavations is that there are mothers who stood in front of their children and took the bullets. There are fathers who stood in front of their children and took the bullets. There are husbands who stood in front of their wives. And there are people who were in the graves. And this also comports with the testimony that we had misunderstood before. There's testimony of the eyewitnesses, many of them brought in a book called the um, Black Book, uh, which was uh, edited by, um, by um, uh, Vasily Grossman and Ilya Ehrenberg in the Soviet Union. And they report that the ground continued to move for several days. We always thought that that was the gaseous um, expulsions from people who were dead. And now we understand that the ground moving may have actually been people who were alive trying to come out. So to go back to large point, this was the way in which the murders took place in the Soviet, uh, in the occupied Soviet territories. And this is the one area where we do not have an exact counting or even a reasonable counting of the number of people who were killed. And the estimates of the number of dead have been growing in recent years as we find more and more towns, more and more villages in which the death camp, the death, um, the death um, uh, squads had been operating. And consequently, this is the one area that is under researched and is now getting primary research. The Jews who were killed not in round one and in round two, they also came back to dig up the bodies and burn the bodies. This was called Zunderkommando 1005. And the Zunderkommando dug up the bodies in order to burn them in 1943 in order to leave no evidence of the crime, no physical evidence of the crime. But the Jews, after the killings of round one and round two, who were ghettoized, were also sent to concentrate to death camps where they were killed. In German-occupied Poland, and the Poles are correct that there are no Polish death camps. There are Nazi death camps in German-occupied Poland. In those camps, there were six camps that were death camps. Three of them were called Axion Reinhardt camps. That's Belgium, Sobobor, and Treblinka. And these were places which were reserved exclusively for the murder of Jews. 
And let me give you the statistics for one moment just to give you a, a sense of the feel of it. Belzhets, which Tali and I uh, visited together in which her family was uh, killed in, was murdered in, Belzhets was in operation from late February, early March 1942 to December 1942. 500,000 Jews were killed in 10 months by a staff of 104 of whom only 14 were Germans, 90 of them Ukrainian. Treblinka was in operation from um, July 22nd, it was open July 22nd, 1942. July 23rd, which was Tisha B'Av, was the day in which the deportation of Jews from Warsaw began. And then between them and, uh, between then and August 4th, 1943, Somewhere in the neighborhood of 925,000 Jews were killed by a staff of 120, of whom only 30 were SS. Belgium, uh, uh, Silverboard killed about, uh, had murdered about uh, 250,000 Jews between March of 42 and November of 43. Chomno was not a death camp in the normal sense. It was a place in which Jews were loaded onto trucks and killed in mobile uh, killing uh, gassing facilities, then buried and burned in the forest outside of Chomno. And that killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 Jews. And then Auschwitz was three camps in one. Auschwitz I was a Polish camp. Auschwitz II was Birkenau, which was the Jewish death camp, and Auschwitz III was Budomanovitz, which was an entire industrial complex. So if we look back and you ask me what you asked me to speak on, which is the murders from west to east, you're talking about a funneling process, which brought all of the people from the four corners of Europe to these death camps where they were annihilated. Nazis used the term exterminated. Those were not the Jews who were killed close to home. And the death camp was a novum in history. It united the notion of Henry Ford's notion of the assembly line and the factories of death and Charles Darwin's notion of survival of the fittest. And part of what we saw at each place is they not only murdered the Jews, but they took all of the valuables that they could confiscate from them, and they ultimately recycled the bodies in such a way that they extracted gold teeth before they buried the, before they burned the Jews. They also used hair to line submarines, and they did not use body fat to make ashes, but to make soap. That's a myth, but they did use um, the burned bodies and the ashes of that as fertilizer in the idea that you want to reduce the Jews to a consumable raw material to be exterminated and in the light. Hold on for one second, only because my daughter. Are we on now? I'll, I'll get on in a couple of moments. I need to, okay? Bye-bye. So that's the that's the processes that took that uh, took place. We have uh, some time for questions, and then I have to leave because I had made a misjudgment that I thought that you were on Israeli time, but I realized that you're not on daylight savings time because it's winter in South Africa, and uh, we're living in a day which has uh, 95 degrees out uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, which is uh, very hot and um, and the like. So I apologize that I have to run, but let's take a couple of questions and uh, and we'll continue. You'll invite me back, Mary. Thanks, Michael. Sorry, Mary. Thanks, Michael. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, so I just encourage everyone um, to quickly put their questions in the chat. But Michael, I'd just like to ask you if you could tell everybody about um, who were the Einstadtsgruppen? How were they selected or chosen um, to do that work? Well, 
the Einsatzgruppen were 3,000 men. They were uh, ironically not necessarily sadists, and their um, the formal Einsatzgruppen were included uh, scholars. Otto Wallendorf had a two PhDs, was the head of the Institute of War Economy uh, before the war. Uh, and these were men who were tried in a two-day trial by a wonderful man whom you should get to meet and invite Ben Ferenz, who's 100 years old today. And Ben Ferenz brought them to trial, his last living, uh, he was a 27-year-old prosecutor, and he tried them without calling a witness. He merely asked them, is this your signature, and entered their reports. They had Einsatzgruppen report, entered the reports uh, into, into um, uh, evidence. Now, there is a debate as to, in the literature, there's a debate from the 90s between a man by the name of uh, Chris Browning and Daniel Jonah Goldhagen. The debate is, were these ordinary men or were they Germans? And the reality is that almost everybody now agrees that they were ordinary men who were asked to undertake extraordinary deeds and gradually they um, uh, got rid of their conscience, but it did take a toll on them. They had to drink afterwards. Gradually they drank before and even during. But the question is, ordinary men can do extraordinarily evil things and the most remarkable insult to our own common humanity is that even after they do such horrible things, they then can live civilized lives in the aftermath, which tells us something that I don't know how you can kill another man's wife and then come home and embrace yours. I don't know how you can kill another man's uh, child or another woman's child and then come back and play with your kids. But uh, there has to be a psychological disconnect of the highest magnitude. The most interesting thing that both men have concluded is nobody was forced to do this. They could get out of it. But the most important thing was the question of they didn't want to leave their, um, uh, their comrades behind. They didn't want to be known as, as cowardly. And they did it for a sense of solidarity, even if they found what they were doing repulsive. Thank you so let's much. Let's take one more question and then I have to leave only because uh, sure. the second program I'm supposed to be on is uh, chaired by my daughter. And I've sure. learned a long time ago not to disappoint my daughter. Indeed, because she indeed. Will, she will Thank exact you. vengeance. <laughs> exactly. um, we're going to call on Tully Nates to ask her a question. Tully, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, just a very quick one, Michael. I'll not get you into trouble. I'm always very curious about why places like Mali Trotsenets, where they, you do have mass killing, or a place yeah, like Yasenovac, where you do have mass killing in uh, uh, using um, uh, uh, gas vans, are never included in the killing centers. And if you can talk a little bit about it, it's short. Well, I'm, but I'm, I'm happy you talk about Yasinovich because I'm in the process of doing a film on Yasinovich, which has been rudely interrupted by the coronavirus because we can't sit with our, with our editors. The reality is that it's so complex a story that we tried to tell it in, and this is what Mary, you gave me today, tell the larger story and make sure you don't get necessarily drowned in the details. But you also know that there's a phrase in, uh, in English, which is the devil's in the details. That the more you go into the details, the more you understand how very specific it is. And from every detail, you learn much more of, of, of the rest. Uh, I have always followed a principle. I once did a book with a great uh, scholar who understood every leaf on every tree in the forest. And I would write one paragraph and she would write five pages. I would write two paragraphs and she would write 20 pages. But believe me, without my one paragraph, you would never understand because she couldn't understand. She couldn't see the trees and she couldn't understand the forest. So I've tried in my work to combine the large with the specific. And you gave me uh, a short time and a large uh, topic. So I gave you only...
you the large story. We could talk throughout the ghetto, and you've seen the best that I know how to do on the description of the uh, of the mobile killing units in, in a vivid way. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Michael, I, so much. I and we'll take you up on, a, on, on the next round. We'll I'm happy, I'm, you I'm happy to accept the next round. Wonderful. And we'll all the best to your daughter. Thank you so much for your extraordinary wisdom and for sharing it with us. Off you go. Thank you. And thank you to everybody else who joined us. I'm so sorry that we were um, cut slightly short with the questions, but I'm delighted that Michael's presentation was um, as meaningful and profound as it was. Thank you, as always, for joining the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center. We have another event over the weekend of the 4th, 5th of September. We'll be sending around a link for an extraordinary film um, called Defiant Requiem. I urge all of you to watch it. And then we have the in unbelievable maestro conductor um, who will speak to us and tell us a little bit, an 80 year old man, Murray Sidlin, about his journey back to Terezin to conduct this defined requiem again very recently. And I look forward to all of you participating in that. One other announcement that we have um, through Kaylee's wonderful creativity, reimagined our website and it was launched today. And we so look forward to all of you engaging with our website, engaging with our work. I wanted to, as a last sentence, just thank my extraordinary team at the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, Claudia, Maureen and Kaylee for everything. And to my colleagues and friends and to all of you, thank you so much for joining. Good night, stay safe and be well.